Let us pray together. Lord God, we come before you today humbled by your word. God, humbled by your gift of grace. God, we ask that you open our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you. God, open our minds and our hearts to know you and to love you. God, speak to us today in a new way and help us to encounter you this morning. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. Who is personally familiar with crisis? A time when there is intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. I would imagine that many of us are, and you are just shy and not raising your hands. Whether it is a medical crisis, a financial crisis, whether it's a crisis of faith, unfortunately, we are familiar with the fact that crisis comes in all shapes and sizes. It comes in any season of life, and it comes at any time, usually when we least expect it. Now, how many of you have turned towards God in the midst of crisis? see a few hands. Well, as your pastor, I can tell you that you do. Many of you turn towards God in the midst of crisis, and it is a beautiful testimony of your faith. It's an honor to walk alongside you all as you continue to take that next faithful step and to turn toward God in the midst of your crisis. But how many of you met God for the first time? through crisis? How many of us, reaching whatever rock bottom looks like, have encountered God when we did not yet know him? Well, today we are going to learn about a man who was not a follower of Yahweh, but he was experiencing a crisis. He was in the midst of a life or death situation. He fumbled his way through turning to God. He had to set aside his pride and learn how to trust. And through it all, he found Yahweh. He found faith. And his response was to worship. This morning, we are looking at the story of Naaman the leper. You heard an allusion to this story a month ago when Andrew taught us about the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Nazareth. He began his ministry by preaching in his hometown, and it didn't go so well. He was disrespected and faced with not being welcome. But it was during this sermon when he mentioned Elijah feeding a widow, and we looked at this story a couple of weeks ago, and just after he mentions Elijah, he mentions the story of Elisha healing Naaman from leprosy. So we are still in our Luke sermon series, but we are taking a moment to look more closely at how, God, about how Jesus was defining his ministry by building on the ways that God was on the move in and through the Old Testament. The God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, but is God in and through the Trinity. Friends, we believe that God's character informs Jesus' character and his ministry. For we believe in one God. And this God, our God, has revealed himself through his holy word. And Jesus uses the word of God to inform his ministry. So turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 19. You will see it on the screen. So let us hear of Naaman's story of faith, of trust, and this will make more sense later, Israel's dust. What can I say? I am a huge Tinkerbell fan. So friends, hear the word of the Lord. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. 
He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God, he stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, Please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's text brings us to the middle of Elisha's ministry at the time when Israel was constantly at war with neighboring nations. Elisha helped bring Israel through battles with Moab and Aram. But Elisha is most well-known and honestly is, is defined by the ministry of his mentor, Elijah. God commanded Elijah to anoint Elisha to succeed him as his prophet. And Elijah did just that. 
Elijah went to Elisha and threw his cloak around him, designating Elisha as his successor. And Elisha left everything. He left his vocation, his family, his home, and he followed Elijah, becoming his servant, training to be the next prophet of Israel. And Elijah knew the day that he was going home to be with the Lord. Now, Elijah never died. God came down and brought Elijah into heaven with him. And Elijah said to Elisha, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? And Elisha refused to leave Elijah's side and was with him throughout that entire final day. And Elijah said to Elisha on that day, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha replied, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And if you remember the story, Elijah said that Elisha would inherit a double portion of his spirit if he witnessed Elijah being taken up into heaven. And sure enough, Elisha was able to witness Elijah being taken into heaven by a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. And Elisha received the double portion. So Elisha's ministry with Elijah's spirit is in line with Elijah's ministry. One scholar says, Elisha wished that Elijah's mighty prowess might continue to live through him. And it did. Elisha raised a boy from the dead. He provided for a widow. He supplied food to people. And as we will see, he cured a man of leprosy. What is clear is that God is working through Elisha. Elisha is clearly a prophet of the Lord. He is an instrument to bring God's word and work into the world. So when Jesus refers to Elijah and Elisha in his ministry, he is pointing to the diverse ways that God works in Israel and beyond. So that brings us to our passage this morning. A man named Naaman is invited to go to Elisha, to the prophet of Yahweh, to seek healing from leprosy. But who is Naaman? Naaman was the commander of the Syrian army and was respected by the king of Syria because of his victories. Syria and Aram are the same geographic location. So Naaman was the commander of the Aramean army and the king of Syria was the king of Aram. The New Testament refers to Naaman as Syrian. The Old Testament translates it as Aram. Same guy. Same place, same king. Scripture tells us Naaman was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. And as we heard last week in the story of Jesus healing a leper, leprosy is a skin disease that is life-threatening because it leads to severe infection. And leprosy does not discriminate. Anyone can be jeopardized. It does not matter if you are rich and can afford the best medical help or if you are poor. It doesn't matter if you are from Israel or if you are a Gentile. It does not matter who you are, what you've done, or what society decides you are worth. Leprosy does not discriminate and it kills. Naaman has survived many battles. But everyone knew that a battle against leprosy was a guaranteed loss. Naaman's wife had a servant. She was a young Israelite girl who was taken captive in one of the raids in a battle between Aram and Israel. And God has a habit of speaking through those whom society doesn't give a voice. And it's through this young girl that Naaman is pointed in the direction of Israel. She said to Naaman's wife, 
If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom Israel. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went to the king and told him what the young girl had said. And the king surprisingly said, by all means, go. And he sent a letter to the king of Israel, legitimizing Naaman's trip. And Naaman set off for Israel, taking the letter and an exorbitant amount of money. He turned toward Israel. Is this the turning point of his faith? Not quite, but the crisis of his leprosy and God's work are paving the way for that moment of faith. And going to Israel was a last-ditch effort. Aram and Israel had been at war. The girl is evidence of this. But Naaman has two options. Die from leprosy, or go into enemy territory and risk it for the biscuit, and potentially die trying. He went with option two, and he went into Israel, Naaman presented the letter from his king to the king of Israel, and as any good international policy works, he did this with the bad blood between Israel and Aram. But the king of Israel didn't quite get it. Respecting God and God's power, he replied to Naaman, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? And he honestly thought that Aram was picking a fight. But thankfully, word got to Elisha, whom Naaman was supposed to see, and Elisha asked the king to send Naaman to his home. But Elisha did not talk with Naaman. This is quite the story. Naaman sent a messenger, or Elisha sent a messenger to Naaman, and the messenger said, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. So earlier we looked at the very beginning of a path to faith. Well, this is the need for trust. Naaman did not trust that this would work. His reaction was anger and frustration. And at first, our reaction can be, Naaman, calm down. He said that you would be cleansed. Your question has been answered. All will be well. And that's essentially what his servants said to him. But Naaman was deaf to the good news because of his frustration. Naaman said, I thought that Elisha would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God wave his hands over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers in Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And then he went off in a rage. But this reaction isn't as foreign to us as it should be, right? We're human, And we get mad. Mad at the cancer diagnosis after being in remission for years. Mad at the unexpected death of a loved one. Mad at losing a job. Mad or frustrated at fill in the blank. And I want you to hear that it's okay to be frustrated with God. It is. But it's not okay to react how Naaman did. Naaman not only was frustrated, but he let his frustration turn him away. One of my favorite ways to pray is through lament. Honestly, without the ability to lament, I don't know where my faith would be today. Prayers of lament are bringing our sorrows, our frustrations, our cries to God. So rather than taking our frustration and turning away, we are taking our frustration and turning towards God. That matters. 
And we see examples of lament all throughout Scripture. Jesus lamented when he hung on the cross. David lamented when he was convicted of his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah. Psalms of lament make up about a third of the book of Psalms. Friends, the word of God invites us to turn to God in our frustration. We can't turn away with our frustration. But Naaman turned away. He could not hear that going into the water seven times would heal him because he was so frustrated by what he assumed he deserved. He's the great Naaman. Surely Elisha could talk to him, could call upon Yahweh on his behalf in a grand way, like Elijah called upon Yahweh against Baal. Surely Yahweh could grant him the healing that he's willing to pay an absurd amount of money for. And we know that that's what was going to happen, but it didn't happen how he wanted A messenger of Elisha came and told him a simple task of what to do. But it wasn't as he envisioned. Naaman's servants, taken aback at Naaman's response, pointed out that Naaman was offered the chance to be healed. They are seeing that Naaman has no reason not to trust the word of the messenger. Naaman's life is at stake why would he turn back now? They said to him, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? And so he did. Naaman went to the river. He reluctantly did as he was told. And he was healed. This was a step of faith. He pursued a path toward Yahweh without fully understanding what it meant. And he took a reluctant step of trust and eventually did as he was told. It was a clunky turning of faith, but he did it. Friends, God meets us in crisis. Turning to God for the first time in a crisis is a valid and beautiful way to meet God for the first time. And turning toward God in the midst of crisis when you know him and have a relationship with him is a continued act of our faith, a continued sign of your faithfulness. Doing what is asked of you, what scripture tells you, or doing what God seems to be asking of you even when it doesn't make sense, even when it doesn't come in the form that we expect, even when it doesn't answer our prayers exactly as we envisioned, it's important. We are not God. We don't know the ways of God. We don't get to have all of the answers. But we believe in a God who is all-powerful, who loves us more than we can imagine. And we believe in a God who is faithful. God has not given us a reason not to trust him. Brothers and sisters, we must have faith and be willing to take a step of faith towards God, even when, especially when, we are in crisis. We must trust. God. So faith, trust, what about Israel's dust? Elisha would not accept Naaman's payment. God cannot be bought. When we give our offerings to God, it is not done as a payment of services. And there's more happening here than simply Naaman's physical healing. That day, after Naaman stepped out of the river for the seventh time, his soul was healed. He believed. 
He took a step of faith. He reluctantly trusted, and he was healed. And he said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And we can see how God was on the move through it all, through the young Israelite girl, through Elisha, through Elisha's messenger, through Naaman's servants. God was there through it all and saw Naaman through his crisis of health and his crisis of faith. And how does Naaman respond? He asks for dirt. He said, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant of this. Naaman knows that there is no God in the world except the God of Israel. But Naaman does not live in Israel. So he's taking a piece of Israel home with him. He also knows that he will be required to bow down in the temple of Ramon. So Naaman is ensuring that when he bows, he will bow on Israel's dust, on the land of Yahweh, and he will worship Yahweh. Faith, trust, and Israel's dust. Sometimes it feels impossible to have faith in the midst of crisis. Sometimes trusting God makes no sense. But when we take the next faithful step, when we trust in God, let's follow Na Naaman's example and worship God wherever we are. Jesus is defining his ministry through his sermon in Nazareth. He's proclaiming that God is the God of the whole world. Jesus came for both the Jew and the Gentile. He came, he died for all of us because of God's love and God's faithfulness. Let us pray. Lord God, we turn to you. Help us to take a step of faith. Help us to trust you. And God, help us to worship you. God, help us to give you our hearts, to give you our lives, and to live as your servants, prophesying to a world that there is no God other than you. God, may we see you more clearly and may we follow you more strongly. God, you are our God. You alone are our God. May we turn to you in crisis. May we turn to you in joy. God, may every piece of our life, the good and the bad, be offered to you. And may we see you in and through it as we live our lives according to your word, as we live our lives in obedience to Jesus Christ, and as we seek to be your disciples. God, we pray this in your name. Amen.